That didn't come overnight for the band Blue Rodeo. It never does. The Toronto band logged lots of miles and slogged it out on the bar circuit before their debut album started climbing the charts. The album is a year old now and it's still going strong. Try was the top 10 song that got Blue Rodeo out of its familiar hometown haunts and into the bigger clubs across the country. The front men for Blue Rodeo are two high school buddies, Greg Keeler and Jim Cuddy, who share the singing duties. They're longtime partners. They played together in a number of bands, including a few years of musical experimentation in New York City. But New York was too tough a nut to crack, so the two returned to Toronto and put together Blue Rodeo. The band has built its reputation on hard work and commitment, and their sound has evolved from performance live night after night with their hit album recently released internationally blue rodeo is riding high joining me now two members of the band blue rodeo greg keeler and jim cuddy first question why are you guys so cool <laughs> <laughs> thanks for asking that too. Yeah. we asked him that's our that. favorite question yeah you're not going to answer it because yeah, you can't deal yeah. with it okay i've got a confession to make when i was told that i was going to do this interview producer said, have you heard of Blue Rodeo? And I said, no. She but you've said, been away, right? And I've been away. You've been, been away for a year, Brunswick. into China, yeah. doing something, yeah. yeah. So she said, go out and get the album. So I went out and got the disc instead, because it sounds better. You TV guys. Right and uh, put it on, and it's a really good album. It's a dynamite album. You've got jazz in there, you've got country, you've got early rock and roll. Did you set out to, to, to do any one particular music style, or did you just say, let's go into the studio and see what comes out? Well, I think as a band, we just wanted to do a whole pile of stuff. And since uh, the, everyone in the band contributes to the sound and everyone sort of brings their, you know, expertise and, you know, there's a lot of different influences. So it was, uh, it was never like a conscious, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to mm -hmm. do this, but we weren't going to put any limitations on what we do. And uh, I think that still exists. We, you know, we still want to spread it out the spectrum as much as possible. Who's buying this album? You've sold, it's gone platinum, 100,000 copies. Who's buying it? Who's it aimed at? Family. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> My dad bought 50,000. <laughs> I, I think it's kind of all over the board, you know? We seem, to, uh, we seem to initially appeal to a bit of the street crowd, and then Try kind of started to make us, give us a middle-of-the-road crowd. And it seems in the last few months, we started to get the younger crowd which is really what we've been waiting for. Well, that surprised me, because when I heard it, I thought, this, this is not an album aimed at the preteen set or, or the high school. There's this, this has intelligent lyrics. It has music that's really well done. And I thought people that are older would appreciate it. But you're saying you're, get, you're getting a 13 or 14-year-old girl screaming at you at concerts. I think, you know, kids are, are a lot more sophisticated, you know, than, you know, when I was a kid, I was a lot more sophisticated than my parents, or at least I thought so. And, uh, I'm more sophisticated than you are now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you guys you know, are friends, right? <laughs> barely. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how success really yeah. washes any friendship. Separate interviews, please. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you, know, you know, kids, have got, they got a lot of things to deal with. You know, they watch the news every night, and, uh, you know, they know it's a pretty weird world. And, and I think that, yeah, initially, they, they try was sort of like the song that sort of created the audience for us. But, uh, once they listen to the whole record, you know, they, they, they click on. Like we were playing in Chatham last weekend to an all-ages gig, and we're all these kids, and they're, they're, lip, they're, they're mouthing the words to a song like Piranha Pool, and, you know, that's sort of... You guys spent some time in New York. How, how did that affect your, your writing and uh, putting together your music? I th most of this, the record was written in New York. Right? About half, I guess, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think the time in New York, we went down to New York to... Uh, we left Toronto, we were in a popular band here, and we thought, well, we'll go down to New York and become, you know, big time. And it was very disillusioning, and I think that we sort of uh, came to grips with a lot of the myth of what rock and roll is, or just the life of celebrity and all that sort of stuff. And we sort of said, ah, oh, forget it, this is ridiculous. But it wasn't being offered to us, that's <laughs> yeah. You guys weren't getting it. We were getting left out. No, right, we, so we rejected home. it. Well, you, you can get big time in Canada, though, can't you? Oh, I think for us it was a... It was way different. What, what happened to us in New York was all very fragmented, just uh, little pieces of hope and, and little accomplishment. And it wasn't until we came back here that we actually had a band that could play all the time, play a whole evening, yeah. to get to be a good band. You know, and we, we really needed that. We couldn't really just work in a studio and piece songs together. We needed to have the feeling of a real band. And I, would, I don't think any of what has happened to us would have happened to us in New York. I want to ask you about, about the band's name, Blue Rodeo. There's a lot, there's a 
resurgence going on now in country music down in the States, uh, Lyle Lovett and Dwight Yoakam and the, the Trio album. Are you guys cashing in on that? Is rodeo <laughs> turning a lot of people off from... Don't pull any punches, Terry. Just ask that. <laughs> You're cashing in on that. Yeah, this East Coast honesty is starting oh, to I, bug me. God, I you like guys, it. You guys I want like. Andy. <laughs> Let's get out of here. We're, we're, we're gone. Uh, but rodeo, like, you, okay, rodeo, you think of cows, horses, clowns, right. red noses. I think that when you, when you, whenever you deal with a fad, and let's say have a fad in music or a trend in music, you're scared that, uh, well, if you get on that bandwagon, you know, or whatever, that when that fad passes and everyone, you know, puts away their, their paraphernalia, that you're going to go with that too. But the, the thing we hope is that, you know, it's been sort of nice that there's been, you know, a lot of media time for, you know, fake cowboys, but uh, it, it, I think that our music will, will live on after the trends die away. Well, your friends and, and your families must be excited. We don't see them anymore. <laughs> yeah, That's the family. price of fame. No, it's it's yeah. too much trouble, really. Yeah. We're always asking for autographs, and could we sign little pieces of memorabilia? Yeah. So it's well, too you, much trouble. You, uh, on, on the album cover, on, on the liner notes, you mentioned your, your first son, and you've got another on the way. Mm -hmm. Will he be listening to this when he's 17, 18? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, Devin even is so keen on the style of music. He's a little more funk-oriented. <laughs> Gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Greg Keeler, Jim, Jim Cuddy, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.